So hello and welcome to this MPTO course on data and trauma and literature. We just finished with Catherine Mansell's short story, The Fly, and in this lecture, I'll begin with a new text, which is uh, Virginia Woolf's novel, Mrs. Dalloway. Uh, we won't start with the text today, so what I'll do instead is I will give you the backdrop of the text, the cultural and political background, uh, rather the biopolitical background, and talk about why this text is such an important uh, narrative for us uh, in this course, trauma and literature. So to start off with, uh, first things first, this is a First World War text. So this is written on the backdrop of the First World War. Uh, it was published in 1925, this novel. Uh, but the backdrop is First World War. It's just after the First World War. It is about, uh, it's about a London which is trying to get back to normal life, uh, to normal civilian space. Now, the interesting thing about the novel is, like I mentioned, it, there is an effort, there is an attempt, there is a superficial, uh, s spectacular structure where uh, everything looks normal and uh, the buses move, the trains move, uh, advertisements happen uh, in the sky. Uh, people seem to be, you know, going out in the streets and having a good time. So everything looks very normal superficially. But at a very uh, immediate subterranean level, there is that uh, very traumatic landscape. Uh, there is that mourning metropolis which is there, which is not, not quite uh, invisible yet. Uh, is there uh, if you just uh, scratch the surface. Uh, so the, the, the First World War or the trauma of the First World War is there as some kind of a spectral presence. And, and this is quite similar to um, uh, the fly, the, not the short story which you did right now before this uh, lecture. So in the fly too, as you know, um, the, the, the First World War is very much a spectral presence. So the, uh, in the character of the boss's uh, son, for instance, the war appears uh, as some kind of a, you know, a residual ghostly appearance. Uh, it's never quite got rid of. I mean, it's there. Uh, the boss tries to move on. The boss tries to put in new furniture, you know, new kinds of office gadgets uh, in the story. But, uh, you know, despite everything, there is that residual lingering hauntological presence of the First World War. And that hauntological presence is very much there in Mrs. Dalloway too. So in Mrs. Dalloway's novels, so it has lots of characters, it's got lots of narratives uh, crisscrossing each other. So in that sense, it is, uh, it's got hyperlinked. So we have different narratives running across the same plane. It's about one day in London. In that sense, it's a very modernist novel. It's about one calendar day in London. Uh, but you have different kinds of narratives crisscrossing each other, uh, different kinds of characters and different narratives crisscrossing each other, uh, sometimes connecting, sometimes moving away. Uh, so there is a, uh, there's a mutability uh, about the whole story, about the whole storytelling process. There is a mutability about the characters, there's a mutability about the way they appear uh, on page. So uh, the whole panorama of London, uh, as I mentioned, it appears to be a, a post-war London, it appears to be some, a space which wants to move on, uh, have a normal civilian life, um, accelerate, have velocity, have all kinds of things. But, you know, there is that uh, first world war, the, the grayness which is there, uh, it's never quite got rid of. I mean, it's, it just keeps coming up uh, in different disguises. Now, the character in Mrs. Jalloway, uh, who best embodies the war, is uh, a person called Septimus Smith. Uh, Septimus Smith is a war veteran who's come back from the war, and he suffers from what, what clearly is an example of PTSD a post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a very common uh, symptom among veterans, war veterans. Now, the important thing is uh, for us to study when we look at the novel is to look at the way in which Septimus is situated in this urban landscape. I mean, it's a landscape, it's a London which is trying very hard to look normal, it's trying very hard to look healthy, to look happy, to look harmonious. So Septimus becomes uh, an incompatible irritant uh, in, that, in that setting where uh, no one quite likes him, uh, he's alienated, and the alienation of Septimus is important because he comes back from the war, and instead of being a hero, he's looked at someone who's a misfit uh, in this metropolis, uh, who's a misfit, who's a very incompatible irritant, as I mentioned, uh, in the metropolis, which is trying very hard to look normal, which is trying very hard to look happy, to, is trying very hard to look harmonious, and, you know, just try to move on. Now, Septimus doesn't want to move on, so the trauma in Septimus is very much there. He, he sort of fixated to it. Uh, in that sense, he embodies it constantly. Uh, and the constancy of trauma is something which is important for us to understand because everything else is mutable in that metropolis. The buses move, the omnibuses move, the trains move, the uh, advertisements move, people move in and out. But the only constant thing in the uh, that metropolis, the Septimus is trauma. So he's fixated to the trauma. So he becomes uh, uh, the PTSD character, uh, the sufferer of PTSD. And in that sense, uh, he becomes uh, traumatized, becomes someone who's inhabiting that traumatic landscape. 
Right. Now, with that backdrop, what is also important for us to observe is how the medical politics plays out in Mrs. Jalloway. Uh, so how were the uh, doctors represented? So the two principal doctor characters in the story are uh, so people called Mr. Holmes uh, and, and Bradshaw, Mr. Bradshaw. So Holmes and Bradshaw uh, are the two physicians who try to treat Septimus, try to cure him. But among other things, this novel is also about uh, the molody of treatment, the molody of miscure, uh, if you will. So instead of curing him, they, ended up, they end up miscuring him. So the malady of miscure, which happens in Mrs. Jalloway, is because of the lack of empathy. And that's a very important uh, quality, a very important category in the whole novel, the lack of empathy. No one seems to understand each other. And this complete uh, annihilation of empathy, the complete causality of empathy, is something which is important for us to observe. Because that's one of the first things which happens uh, uh, during a war, a post war. Where everything looks normal, uh, uh, there's an attempt to go back to civilian space, civilian life. Uh, you, know, you know, civilian movements, mutability, but the one thing which is missing constantly is empathy, right? So empathy becomes the one missing factor uh, throughout the story. Now, what that obviously means is Septimus, uh, the alienation of Septimus, which I just mentioned, gets compounded, gets exponentially compounded, because no one seems to understand him. The doctors don't understand him. They, they miscure him, they mistreat him. He's almost abused, uh, he's almost coerced and confined, and there's a lot of coercion happening. Uh, so, you know, this whole uh, binary between coercion and care blurs away in Mrs. Jalloway. So care becomes a form of coercion, the coercion becomes a form of care. So he's asked to be confined in a room, he's asked to be fed in a certain kind of meal. Uh, and what happens in the process is, is, is complete, his agency as a human being is completely uh, compromised. And this entire annihilation of agency is something important for us to observe. That there's no agency at all left in Septimus. And that compounds his trauma. And so the real trauma of the war, which is also there, but what, what becomes more important and what becomes more insufferable for Septimus is a lack of understanding that experiences. And that becomes the immediate crisis for him. No one seems to understand him. No one seems to be able to understand what is going through. And the reason why Mrs. Dalloway is such an important uh, novel for us to understand today is because from a neuroscientific perspective, uh, what happens to Mrs. Dalloway is, uh, you know, the, the suffering in Mrs. Dalloway of Septimus, the trauma in Mrs. Dalloway is about the lack of feeling. So Septimus himself, he is unable to feel anymore. He is unable to connect to things uh, at a sentient feeling level anymore. There is a no feeling left. Right, and this lack of feeling becomes important. He's not able to feel, he's not able to emote, he's not able to express his emotions. Right, and that, that is obviously a very complicated, a complex uh, process because there's also part of the uh, masculinity package in, in Mrs. Dalloway, where he was trained not to feel when he was taken, uh, when he was grafted in the war, when he was trained to be a soldier. Among the many drills which he had to go through was also a lack of feeling, right? So he was trained not to feel, he was trained not to emote because that's supposed to be the part of the military masculinity thing, right? So and that becomes uh, internalized in his mind, in his system, to the point that when, he's, when he comes back from the war, when he thinks of his uh, friends who died in the war, this person called Evans uh, in the novel, Septimus is a very close friend, and there is a, there's a very, very um, tenuous hint that Evans and Septimus may have been more than friends. Maybe there was some relationship between them which may or may not have been erotic. We don't quite know, it's never spelled out. But it's interesting to see how Septimus, he keeps thinking about Evans. Uh, Evans comes back as some kind of a ghostly figure in the novel. It's like Banco's Carries and Macbeth. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, Septimus is not able to emote. He's not able to think of Evans in emotional terms because the ability to emote has been taken away from him. Uh, he's not able to uh, have feelings anymore. He's not able to emote anymore. And that compounds his alienation. That compounds his uh, you know, loneliness. So the entire trauma narrative in Mrs. Jalloway is a, is, a, is a combination of medical conditions, political conditions, and also uh, existential conditions. So the fact that he was uh, trained not to emote, he was trained not to feel, he was trained not to express his emotions, so all this become important, all this now compound, all this become uh, multiply suffering uh, to a large extent. And this multiplication of suffering becomes important uh, for Septimus's, from Septimus's perspective, right? So Mrs. Dalloway, as a, as a literary text about trauma, uh, becomes uh, very, very uh, complex because trauma manifests itself in different forms. Uh, so most uh, immediately uh, at a form of uh, feelinglessness, the fact that he cannot feel anymore. And in that sense, it's quite interestingly comparable to The Fly by, by Catherine Mansfield. Because even Mansfield's story, as I mentioned, the, the real trauma comes out of nothingness. 
the fact that he feels so numbed, he's not able to cry anymore, the boss. He's not able to weep anymore for his dead son. And that becomes a real cause of trauma. That becomes a real cause of crisis. So it's like a post-trauma trauma, right? So uh, a post-mourning trauma. So he's not able to mourn anymore. So in the fly, mourning is a performative category. But in Septimus's case, in Mrs. Jalloway, uh, mourning becomes an, an experiential category, an emotive category. He's not able to mourn anymore. He's not able to uh, feel anymore, feel a crisis of his loss anymore. So in that sense, it becomes really interesting. So uh, there are other things in the novel which we'll uh, unpack in due course. But there is also a central character, Mrs. Jalloway, or Clarissa Jalloway. And in the novel, she's throwing a big party. Uh, where all the big people in London are coming, politicians, actors, you know, people with tickets in the parliament, um, they're just saying a social presence, they're all there in the party. Uh, and among other people, there is a person called uh, you know, Peter Walsh. Uh, and Peter Walsh is an interesting character in Mrs. Challoway because Peter Walsh, as you're told, has just come back from India. And this is, a, you know, obviously a post-imperial India. And it's come back to Britain, it's come back to London. And he feels alienated too. And his alienation, like Septimus's alienation, is more existential because he cannot connect uh, to the London anymore. And he's coming back. And at some level, they're quite comparable characters. Although they never meet uh, Septimus and Peter Walsh. They never meet. It's just a past each other sometimes, they never converse, they never talk, they never connect, uh, but they sometimes inhabit the same space-time, which is interesting, because as I mentioned, there is a hyperlinked quality by Mrs. Jalloway, all the narratives sometimes connect to each other, sometimes disconnect, crisscross each other, there's an interplay of narratives at a very interesting level. And the Peter Walsh, uh, he doesn't suffer from trauma, but there's, there's definitely alienation that he has. And the alienation comes because of the post-colonial condition. So he comes back from India to London, uh, and he cannot connect to London anymore because there's a rate change in London, and he's come back from India, and he has an Anglo-Indian wife, which is also interesting. And the Anglo-Indian wife obviously connects him, or, or, or secures him permanently, or positions him permanently as a, uh, as a colonial officer, as a colonial presence. And that colonial presence is now completely alienated because, you know, the London that he comes back to, uh, once you abandon him, once you reject him, uh, like Septimus. So he's very much an abundant character. He's very much um, a leftover uh, in this post imperial, post First World War London, right? Uh, so, so in, in a sense, you know, India is not free yet. You know, it's not 1947, but then there is that post imperial quality coming in. And, and the fact that it's married to an Anglo Indian person is interesting because and that further alienates them, that further uh, takes them away from the white you know, middle class, upper middle class, white privileged circle of London. Right, so uh, the First World War and the colonial backdrop become important uh, cultural political conditions in that play. Right, so we never quite see India, we never quite see the trenches of the First World War, but they keep coming in, they keep um, affecting, they keep infecting the narrative as it were, uh, with their presence, with their recursive presence. Now, if you cut, if you, if you focus on Septimus again, uh, the trauma bit in Mrs. Jalloway, uh, as I mentioned, the real trauma is a lack of feelings, the real trauma is the fact that it's not really a sentient subject anymore, it's just a liquid of a person, it's just someone who's uh, left over uh, from the war. He hasn't died, he's a survivor in the war, uh, but he's not really a glorious survivor. He's someone who's unmanly, someone who's been essentially emasculated by the war. So he's not really a presence where, uh, you know, where he can be glorified and, and you know, he can be re represented as a heroic character. Instead, it's really an unheroic character. There's a degree of deglamorization that takes place in the war. Uh, and in that sense, it's a very realist novel. It's a very gritty, realist novel, Mrs. Jalloway because it doesn't glamorize the war, it doesn't you know, glorify the war at any level. And so it looks at war from a very deglamorized perspective. This is about a person who's been infected uh, by um, the lack of feeling, who's been infected by trauma. And you know, he's just a problem now, he's just an irritant. As I mentioned, he's a very incompatible irritant uh, in this post war metropolis. The doctors don't like him, the civilians don't like him, no one likes him, his own wife doesn't understand him. And uh, the wife character becomes important uh, uh, Rezia becomes important. Rezia is an Italian woman uh, who is also an outsider. So as you can see, uh, it's a novel about outsiders. It's a novel of people who come from the outside, uh, don't quite fit in. Uh, it's a novel about misfits. And if you come to the central character, which is Mrs. Jalloway, uh, she's also an outsider, despite being a white, privileged woman. Uh, there's a degree of alienation that she experiences as well. Right? So Rezia's character is important. She's, a, she's an Italian woman from uh, 
uh, Italy at the September was uh, you know, met during the war. And uh, she's now in London. There's a different culture for him, a different language for him, and also a different husband for him. So, you know, the husband is completely alienated from her entirely. So, it doesn't quite uh, attach to her, doesn't quite connect to her at any level. So, there is a a drama of disconnect going on in Mrs. Jalloway. And this drama of disconnect, this drama of incompatibility, the drama of alienation, that, you know, that is a real problem in Mrs. Jalloway. So the medical condition is there, uh, the war spectral condition is there, the traumatic condition is there, but all that is compounded constantly by the existential emotional conditions. And as I mentioned, the medical condition is emotional, the medical condition is existential, the fact that it cannot emote anymore, it cannot empathize anymore, it cannot uh, connect anymore to other people, that becomes a medical problem, which is grossly mistreated by the uh, medical practitioners, uh, Holmes and Bradshaw, who have this very heavy-handed way uh, to force Septimus to eat, to force Septimus to be confined to a room, to force Septimus to be uh, resting, etc. Right? And the introspective quality of Septimus is seen as a problem, the fact that he's thinking about himself all the time. That is seen as a malady by the doctors. So he's encouraged to think outside of himself. He's encouraged to think of things like cricket. Uh, you know, he's encouraged to play cricket, play outdoor games, uh, do this Boy Scout thing. And again, so the masculinity thing keeps coming up. It's never really away. Right? So the whole masculinity package of Septimus is sort of, that is the main problem in Mrs. Dalloway uh, in that sense. Because that, that becomes, uh, that informs his crisis, that infects his crisis uh, more exponentially. So the whole idea of trauma. Uh, as in, in the fly, is a very complex category in Mr. Chalabin. It's not really about uh, just suffering, it's not really ju about just a medical problem, but the medical problem is never really away from the existential problem, from the emotional problem, from the social problem. All these become connected categories in the, in the novel, and they all connect and they coalesce into each other, and they sort of snowball into each other, and, and it becomes a really uh, complicated category. The trauma in Mrs. Jalloway is an entanglement of medical, social, emotional, and existential conditions. So all that com uh, uh, factors come in, and they contribute to the traumatic quality in Mrs. Jalloway, the traumatic presence in Mrs. Jalloway. So yes, it's a novel about trauma, it's a novel about uh, a PTSD veteran, it's a novel about someone suffering uh, shell shock, and we'll talk about shell shock in a bit. When we uh, start to look at the novel, we'll talk about, we'll unpack the term shell shock. But you know, suffice it to say at this moment that it's a novel about all these things, uh, trauma, shell shock, PTSD, but it's also a novel about existential alienation, and that is manifested not just in uh, Septimus in the novel, but also in the other characters, by Rezia, Septimus's wife, by Peter Walsh, uh, the colonial officer, and by the central character, Mrs. Jalloway. Everyone is um, alienated from their immediate surroundings. So this alienation becomes a part of the trauma experience, part of the trauma narrative uh, in this particular novel. So as I mentioned, it's a modernist novel. It's a novel about one day in London. Uh, so the other thing which we need to be uh, uh, careful about is the use of time, the use of space-time. So we have this uh, modernist space-time, but it's, in terms of calendar time, in terms of clock time, it is one day and it is London trap. But we see interestingly how despite being uh, one day in one place, uh, the characters keep traveling uh, in the minds all the time. So the different kinds of temporalities which come in, there's this traumatic time which is there, there's a uh, clock time which is there, there's psychological time which is there, and they all crisscross into each other, they all undercut each other uh, in very complex ways. So we read the novel, the spatio-temporal quality of trauma is something which we need to be very careful about. The trauma as a spatio-temporal quality, trauma as a spatio-temporal event, Right, so the event of trauma is very, very spatial temporal in, in quality. So it, it, it sort of belongs to another space time and it cannot really be compatible with calendar time, with, you know, with, you know, with clock time, and with standardized space. Right, so this, um, the whole ontology of trauma, and after this, we'll look at some theory on trauma, Kathy Malibu's book, The Ontology of the Accident and the new wounded, we look at those things. But at this moment, it's important for us to understand, especially when we look at Mrs. Jalloway, that the very ontology of trauma, the very event of trauma, it means there's a different space-time which is there for the traumatic person, which is completely incompatible with standardized space-time. So the space-time is shared by everyone, and the space-time inhabited by the traumatic person are completely different, are completely incompatible. And that is a problem in Septimus and Mrs. Jalloway, that he constantly inhabits a different order of space and time. He's constantly transported to a different order of space and time, and it cannot come in and cannot weave in seamlessly uh, with the standardized space and time.
and the lack of seamlessness is exactly what causes the, causes the trauma. The trauma could be seen as a fault line, the fact that it cannot weave in, it cannot mix, it cannot seamlessly uh, be woven into the fabric, the socio-cultural fabric. You cannot do that. So he remains as an outsider, he remains as a leftover, he remains as a spectral presence, as an outsider in the, in the whole narrative. And that obviously compounds his trauma. So we look at these categories very, very carefully. We look at this, the philosophy of trauma very carefully and also the, the experiential quality of trauma very carefully when, when we read the novel. Right? So the spatial temporal quality, the experiential quality, the cognitive quality again is very important because you know there's a lack of a cognition going on, there's a crisis of cognition going on throughout the novel. Septimus cannot uh, cognize certain things, Septimus cannot recognize certain things and, and the lack of recognition obviously is a lack of reconnection, right? So he cannot reconnect uh, to certain very normal things, so because he cannot recognize those things. Uh, so this recognition, reconnection uh, dialectic is important in Mrs. Jalloway. So when he hears something, for example, when he hears a piston, uh, when he hears um, a, 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 an advertising uh, airplane in the sky, he is transported, those act as triggers to him, and he's transported back in some of the space time, which is completely cut off from the space time in which he is physically inhabiting. So there is a physical corporeal space time uh, that is inhabiting um, with other people, but it's also the mental space time where he is there. And it's completely different, it's completely incompatible uh, with the physical space time which is shared. So there's a shared space time and there's a psychological space time, and those are completely disconnected categories in mm -hmm. Mrs. Dalloway. And that disconnect uh, is exactly what causes the trauma uh, in this particular novel. So uh, the whole idea of trauma, we need to look at trauma uh, in these categories and these lenses with its perspectives and also the perspective of memory. Uh, trauma has a crisis in memory because the only memory he has the only memories that he can recover and represent in his mind are uh, the memories of loss, right? So uh, it's a very metonymic thing. So by metonymy, I mean selected, fragmented. So it's a very fragmented process through which he informs himself. So there's a degree of uh, the crisis of the self. There's no stable self in Mrs. Jalloway. So the lack of stability of the self is important. Uh, the self becomes disintegrated. And this disintegration is important because you know, he doesn't integrate it, it himself uh, in a civilian space. Uh, so the, again, the, the lack of integration becomes important. And that is obviously spatio-temporal, the lack of integration. He cannot integrate with the space and time. He cannot integrate with the surroundings. He cannot integrate with the other selves around them. So in some sense, it becomes the crisis of the self. Right? And that is important for us to understand as well. So uh, just to wind up, uh, when we look at Mrs. Jalloway, we look at it obviously with the medical lens, but also with the philosophical lens, with the social lens, with the culture studies lens, with the fictional lens, with the literary studies lens. So all these different perspectives will come in, which will make it very uh, fascinatingly interdisciplinary. So the interdisciplinary quality in the novel is exactly because it offers so much uh, to the readers, even after almost 100 years of writing. So there is a medical traumatic uh, lens, there's a cognitive philosophical lens, there's a social, sociological, cultural lens, and also there's a gendered lens, the, 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 the post colonial lens. So all these lenses are available and they all have very, very valid readings in terms of reading the novel. And you can all bring it together uh, and read it as a very interdisciplinary complex narrative about trauma, about self, about loss, about alienation, about nostalgia, about all those things and how these become connected categories. So trauma is not something which happens in the brain. Trauma doesn't, it doesn't also an extended quality about trauma. It's not just embedded, it's also extended. It also affects your social movements, it also affects your extended movements, your extended embodiment. It's not just about something which is embedded in the brain. There is an embedded quality, of course, but there's also the extended quality, which is you know, very, very important for us to recognize when we read the novel. So, this is a backdrop, and this is a philosophy which we'll use uh, appropriately when we read the novels. I hope you find it interesting. So, for the next class onwards, we'll start looking at the novel, uh, the text. Obviously, we'll do uh, certain selections on the text. We can't read it entirely, it's not practically feasible, but it's important for us to understand the, uh, how this narrative that we talked about goes in the novel how it is dramatized in a novel. So we look at certain selected potions and we do close readings of those potions in terms of understanding how trauma and fiction uh, can become important categories of representation of the self in alienation. So we'll start with the novel in the next lectures. Thank you for your attention.